Hello, everybody, again. I'm sorry about that. We have got untold troubles, and I'll show you why I think we have untold troubles. Let me just get to this corner over here. I think if you look up, that's where we live, at Angama Mara. Unfortunately not in the uh, salubrious guest tents that they have there, although our tents are very salubrious. But you can see above there, there is a fairly large storm burgeoning, and I think that that changes the atmospheric pressure. Well, obviously it does. It plays havoc with signal, and it is therefore... I'm guessing that we are struggling to broadcast for you. Sorry we left those vultures. We had to do that. Uh, we didn't know when we'd ever see you again, but here you are, back again. There's also a very large storm, which I'm going to show you over here. There it is. An enormous storm coming in from the east, which makes me deeply terrified to the core of my being. As I quiver in my small size sevens, let's head across to Scott Dyson, a he of the beard like a male lion, and see if this time he is able to say hello to you. It isn't working. Um, I would put it down to a cable jiggling extraterrestrial being in outer space. Possibly. Those are my thoughts. My name's Scott Dyson. It's great to have you on board with myself and Manu on camera. We have decided to drive the river road, which takes us south from our camp, in the hope that we may find Scar, a big male lion. He likes to lurk a little bit further south from here, quite close to the river. He works both sides of the river. He actually swims across it from time to time. And for those of you who don't know about Scar or haven't heard about him, he is a massive, massive, really impressive male lion. Beautiful big black mane. And we haven't seen him for a while. There was a request by somebody, I forgot who, this morning for us to go and look for him, as well as another request that came through this afternoon from a special friend of mine. So, that is the plan, and we're going to loop around back to the young, two young male lions that we had this morning if we don't have any further luck. Hopefully the storm that we're heading towards that James I think also just showed you um, is not going to affect us. But we do have a circus-like tent that we can drop down, cover ourselves up and keep dry. It just doesn't make for the most entertaining safari, sadly. So let's, fingers crossed, hope for rain to be elsewhere, just not around us. We do need the rain in the general area, just not right where we are. What's fascinating on that topic is that We've really worked out and got an understanding of how localized the rain can be. Sometimes up at camp, which is up on the escarpment, the Oloololo escarpment to our right, just a little bit further behind us. Up there it can be raining and down here it can be dry and vice versa, yet the distances can be very, very short between where the rain is falling and where it is not. I have got good news. We are going to stop very quickly and show you some striped animals before we send you south to Juma to show you a spotted animal, one of the most iconic of Africa and a very, very beautiful one indeed. Over to Byron. <laughs> Oh, now we are going to go and try and help one of the other guides. He's found some leopard tracks, and um, and they look fairly fresh. So we're going to try and maybe work in that area and give him a hand. I'm just having a look quickly because spot giant eagle owl, but we haven't seen it for quite some time. Now I'm not sure if it's possibly just moved. Um, from these trees, maybe further down the river, um, the dry riverbed. This is the Mwati, um that we are s sitting above at the moment. So I don't know. They they tend to move from tree to tree, um, especially these big jackalberries, these thick trees. Always nice to for them to roost up there during the day. A lot of cover, a lot of foliage for them to hide in, until eventually they will come out at night, be a bit more active and try and hunt. Although, the other day, 
I say that, but the other day, Tristan got that giant eagle owl that was feeding on something and caught in the morning or in the afternoon. Tristan watched it the afternoon. It was busy feeding in one of these trees. Ah, oh, I've spotted some vervet monkeys. Let's see if we can get a glimpse of them. Can you see it there? Oh, there it is. <laughs> Just looking down at us. That's a young one, a little vervet monkey. Enjoying the afternoon sun in this big jackalberry. I like the scientific name of the jackalberry actually. I mean, we James used to drill these scientific names into us. We'd have to know them. And it is important so you don't get confused between the trees and different common names. Sometimes um, common names get confused, but with scientific names, it ha only has one name. So it can't be called a number of different things because the jackalberry was also used to be known as the um, ebony. Um, but the scientific name is Diospyrus mispelliformis. <laughs> Try to say that five times fast. You see these monkeys are enjoying the jackalberry fruit at the moment. The Jersey Lady and Jenny Animation, you are very excited and happy that we found some monkeys. It is always fun and entertaining to watch some of the monkeys outside of camp and away from camp. And I say that because they can get very cheeky and they do steal things like food and sugar and coffee and um, all sorts of... If you leave anything out, the monkeys and the baboons will possibly raid the camp. So it's nice to see them out of the camp and feeding on natural food like this jackalberry fruit. I also think with these monkeys being around, they would probably probably irritate the owl and probably chase the owl out of the trees. Now, Eduardo, you were asking just something that was on my mind. Um, you were wondering if the eagle owl, the giant eagle owl, could feed on um, on one of these monkeys. And I'm trying to see if there is any any sign of them uh, um, feeding on monkeys. And yes, there is, Eduardo. They would. So maybe the younger monkeys. I doubt a baboon. Baboons are far too big. But the younger, smaller monkeys, yes, the giant eagle owl will try and catch them. But I think if these monkeys are around in the trees, the adults will probably chase the, the owl away. It's interesting, this... It's interesting that they say that a giant eagle owl can will even or has even been recorded in catching um, young piglets, warthog piglets. Oh, that's interesting. That, I wouldn't have guessed that. OD farming. You asked if there are any other primates around here that we see. Yes, and the baboons, the Chakma baboon. Uh, probably, well, not probably, it is the largest primate out here. Other than Tristan, but he's on leave at the moment, so it's... <laughs> I'm only joking, Tristan. I'm only joking, Tristan. <laughs> Hopefully he's watching. Um, he, he'll be back on Thursday. But uh, no, the baboons, OD monkey. OD farmer, sorry, OD farmer. <laughs> you see, I've got, I've got monkey on the brain now. <laughs> I apologise, OD farmer. <laughs> oh, see, we get so tied up with 
I'm tongue-tied with all these different names. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this gets fed through to James. I'm sure he'd have something to say about this. But let's go and see what he's doing and how his drive is going. <laughs> now we're up here because we want to get a bit of a vantage over the Mara and see what is left. This is wildebeest wire, so we're just going to gaze out towards the river, which is the band of trees in the far distance, next to which I believe Scott is now taking shelter from the rain, which makes me very nervous indeed. And I'll tell you that. And there's still a lot of wildebeest. Mm. There is actually still a lot of wildebeest action off to the far east and southish areas. So that is good, and I can still hear some canoeing and gnawing. The rain is starting to fall, but it's not, certainly not heavy enough yet for us to stop. So let us continue, shall we, Craig? What I'll do is just start the car. It's very noisy, this car, so I'm going to start us off. We are on the slope, and then switch off, and we can just roll down the hill together. Ah, this is much more pleasant than the dulcet sounds of the 300D turbo diesel. Not so, Batman. Batters agrees. Batters is not a fan of the diesel engine. I don't think we're going to go along there. I think we're going to go all the way down here. Now, Mr. Cactus, what an appropriate name you have for the question you have asked. You say, are there any invasive species of concern in the Mara? Uh, well, other than the human being, I'm going to say not really, although I have seen one or two species of cactus, which of course are not indigenous to Africa. There is no ca indigenous cactus species in Africa. And so, uh, I'm going to say one or two. I don't think there are any that are of major concern, no. Yes, there will be various exotics that come down the rivers when they come down in flood. Any river that runs through a rural village or a town, or it doesn't even need to be rural, it can be urban, is going to bring with it all sorts of things that aren't necessarily supposed to be in an area like this. And so I'm sure that happens all the time. But there are no, like, in various parts of Africa, for example, the water hyacinth has taken over enormous part, uh, water systems and blocked them up and made things very difficult. Uh, we know that cactus has overrun some places. South Africa's got major problems with something called a chromolina or triffid weed. Uh, out here, I don't know of any major issues. So that's quite nice, actually. It's a tremendously resilient ecosystem that's it is quite spectacular and I think that it's, you know, it's, while one hesitates, in fact, one should never use the term in harmony when as far as nature goes because it gives a false sense of a kind of peacefulness that exists. This ecosystem and its occupants from a, a human and animal point of view have been here for much longer than they have in many parts of Southern Africa's ecosystem, for example, with the exception of perhaps Botswana and Namibia, which have hardly any people in them at all. This ecosystem has been function functioning like this probably for close on 100,000 years, and if you include our ancient human ancestors, uh, more than a million years. And I think that's given it a resilience to our effects on it that perhaps many others do not have. And speaking of which, this is going to be the very first time I've done this. There's a beautiful white flower. Look. What it is, I don't know. Judy H., your first, your very first flower test of the Masai Mara. What on earth is that thing? Judy H. pointed out that when I was showing you something the other day, there was a beautiful <laughs> red flower next to it, and she pointed out that I had not mentioned it, and I hadn't even noticed dreadful it was of me. Anyway, there is a flower for you, Judy H., and you can try and tell me what it is. I couldn't begin to imagine. I'm afraid the rain is now starting to fall, which 
which is a little distressing. Anyway, much we can do about that. All right, let's head across to Byron, I believe, who is looking for number 91 on his bird list. Byron, of course, is uh, drawing the saga out forever. Wow, what is that? Hold on, everyone. I've got an interesting bird. Oh, there, there it is. Can you see it flew back again? Sorry, 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 Seb. Um, we've got a bird that I definitely is not. A, oh, it's not on the list. There it goes. Oh, it's. You know what? We might get a. Hold on, everyone. This is very exciting. This is not a bird we see very often at all. Mm. There it goes again. Let's see if we can get it. It was. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. There it sits. There it sits. Straight ahead. Did you get it there, Seb? What? on earth is that uh sorry down there we go there we go quickly everyone get loads of screenshots okay now i need to look quickly what is that um give me a second we'll work it out we'll work it out um i think is it not an eastern no never mind <laughs> it's not that. Um, yo, what is that? Um, is it not a? I've hit a complete blank. There is a bird I've got in my mind, and I can't remember the <laughs> the name for some reason. That you don't see very often and I'm sure some of my friends are shouting at me now because I can't get it where did it go so we can get a again I'm sure it was still in this tree somewhere why now ah. Was it a cuckoo shrike? It was another black cuckoo shrike. Hold on. Let me just have a look here and see if I can find it. Um, I think it's a female black cuckoo shrike, if I'm not mistaken. It is. Yeah, I almost had a moment where I was getting very cross with myself. It is a female black cuckoo shrike, everyone. That is a wonderful bird to see. Look at that. That is a lovely, lovely bird. The black cuckoo shrike. I'm sorry, there are just some other vehicles coming through here. I'm going to just move out of this area. I don't want to move... Um, uh, oh get in their way and the other vehicles are out and drive and try to spread out a bit I think they're all coming to the area now to have a look for the set maybe check around black I knew I knew what it was it's so frustrating sometimes when you've got a bird in mind and you just can't remember the name 91 that I did not expect to see a black cuckoo shrike that is wonderful That is really, really great. <laughs> I got so excited, I forgot the name. Can you believe it? Now, um, well, but that that is a lovely sighting of one. Uh, I'm glad now. I've, I think some friends of mine, as I said, some friends of mine are probably shouting at me. And, um, I know Craig and Alistair are watching. So if you guys are watching, I don't know if you knew what that was actually. Probably not. <laughs> I'm sure they'll send me messages and see if they did. It's Sunday, of course, um, so everybody's having Sunday lunch and getting together with friends. 
See, we have to work on Sundays. It's okay, though. We don't mind. Hey, Seb. It's not, it's not really work. It's a pity there isn't any water in Chile pan. It's dried up completely. It's a little pan that we're approaching now. I'm sure we would have a lot of birds around there. I really did not expect to see a black cuckoo shrike. That was a great surprise. You know what we haven't seen in a while, everyone, is giraffe. I was just thinking about that now. I haven't seen giraffe for quite some time. About a week, I think, was the last time we saw giraffe. I just want to have a look around here and see if we can't pick up another bird or two. But in the meantime, let's head across to Scott. Oh, that sun is bright. And apparently he's got rain covers on. It might be raining there already. And this is due to the fact that the green canvas one above us was not made very well and it is like a sieve so we've got this blue top on top of that and we kind of semi bunk it down now what i want to try and do is work some angles there's some beautiful rays of sun poking up here we're just gonna have to park the car i'm hoping this will give manu enough of a view just to sneak through let me hold this up there we go excuse the cable we do oh! There we go. Beautiful. Look at that. The sun's coming through the clouds and it is making a wonderful scene. But there is some slight drizzle. I mean, it's on and off, but as soon as it does start raining, we cannot take any chances. We've got some seriously funky and expensive equipment on these vehicles to make this live broadcast possible and we would hate for it to get wet. The good news is we are redeveloping and redesigning the roof and the canvas structure and our first new modifications should be in or finished soon, I'm hoping within the next week, which will make our lives a lot easier with regards to the rainy weather. So that's something to look forward to. Hello Riti, you are quite impressed by the traveling circus and I am happy to hear that. That's good news. Um, very good news actually. We try our best and that's one of the things with Safari Live is that because we're kind of the only people to really do this kind of a thing, we have to pioneer new roads and new ways to get things done. Sometimes it's not very pretty but it often does work and this is an example of that. The amount of tinkering and work that's done to all, in order to get all the equipment on these vehicles and working and linked together is actually quite phenomenal and I love watching the tech guys and cameramen work out the puzzles and mysteries to get everything working. Enough about that, it sounds like you have got some beautiful sunny weather in South Africa, not like the gloomy rainy weather here in the Masai Mara, so why don't you go and jump on Byron's car and enjoy the sunshine. Alright, so we tr still trying to work on our bird list. Um, apparently, just, excuse me a second, sorry, I'm just listening to the radio, to the radio. Sorry, I'm just listening to the radio, the guides that are looking for that leopard. So maybe we can help each other find that leopard. Sorry, I'm just listening everyone. Give me a second, these guides are updating each other. It sounds like they might have found a leopard or caught a glimpse, caught a glimpse of a leopard. <laughs> Hold on. A mic, mic for Byron. 
Mike, sorry, I've just uh, been off for, for 20 minutes. Um, did, have you still got visual of that animal? Okay, copy that. No problem. There's no rush. That's fine. Thanks very much, Mike. Copy. No problem. We'll get an update later. Thank you. Um, oh, that's great news. It sounds like they've found a male leopard, everyone. I'm not sure which male it is yet, but it sounds like they have found a male leopard. Um, now, there are... There were, two or three vehicles already in that area looking for him so they found him but it sounds like he's gone and laid down in the Mulwati so that's okay that's good news for us so we'll let them have a view and we'll go in a little bit later and I'm sure we'll get some to be honest it might even be better for us to go a bit later because possibly we'll get that leopard moving around that's what I'm hoping for and maybe better light, exactly, Seb. So let's carry on driving around and see what else we can find for now. We'll give the other guests a view and then we'll try to get in there a little bit later. I think that'll work out nicely for us. Um, see, it helps to chat to one another on radio. You know, we, we were fortunate the other day we found Hosanna and we let the other guides know and they came and enjoyed the sighting with us. And vice versa, we all keep in touch and it's very important uh, while we are guiding and um, just making it a little bit easier to look for these animals because, of course, we can't be everywhere all the time. But there's always something going on out here. So if we try to spread out and cover a huge, uh, a larger distance or larger area, then we'll probably find more. Okay, well... Uh, someone who's not going to be um, concerned about the rain is Steph, who is actually in the um, in the control room at the moment, watching the river cams. Good afternoon, and uh, yes, welcome to the river cameras for the first time today. It has been very quiet on these river cameras today, and I think it is because of the increased flow of water as you can see from that fantastic shot from May North. My name is Steph Winterboer and uh, it is my pleasure to, uh, to, um, to host these river cams for you today. What I do want to do is, while we, before we lose it, I'd love to show you a shot from the mountain cam, please. No, don't go anywhere, bird. Don't go anywhere. Can you see that? That is a... Oh. That is just such a lucky shot for us. I've been trying to get that for ages. So this is an um, auger buzzard that is part of a pair that come on windy days up into this valley that we live in. And I think hover for a while to silhouette themselves against the sky so that other auger buzzards can actually see uh, them silhouetted against the dark sky. Let's see if I can get us in a little bit better. There we go. Come on, there we go. Legs out to create a little bit of drag. Oh, where are we going? We come back here, bird. <laughs> and there we go, back into. This is the. Why didn't it want to stay still today? And are we going to lose it? No, still in the same place. There we go. And as you can see, there's enough wind speed at the moment to, to allow this bird without flapping to stay aloft. Isn't that just fantastic? It's hunting at the moment. I actually saw a mouse in the, in the bush now. I was busy walking in the bush just before I came through and I saw a mouse now. So they're out enjoying the... Oh, this is going to get difficult. Let me just go a bit wide and use VM Durenbrach's bird following technique. Isn't that just the most amazing thing? We see this bird most days here. I don't know if it's the same bird. Could possibly be. Where have you gone now? Roshni, you say you're really envying us in the Mara right now. Roshni, where are you stuck on this planet today? You can't just say something like that without letting us know where you are and what you are doing. Um, it is a brilliant day out here in the Mara. I must be honest, it's been overcast and quite cold. I woke up cold this morning for the first time since we got here six months ago. And um, it hasn't really warmed up the whole day. It stayed this sort of gloomy this gloomy, uh, let me darken a little bit, you can see the cloud cover above us, re re relatively high up, quite thick clouds 
hanging over the escarpment here and it's been rather blustery. It hasn't rained at all, although that seems like it's going to be changing for Scott and James Shaman. I feel for them out there on days like this. It is not comfortable in these cars when it rains at all. In actual fact, that almost be in a city when it rains. Anyway, let's go through the cameras a little bit. I want to show you something. If we could go to cul-de-sac crossing, please, Alice. I did mention that it was raining last night. <clears throat> As you can see, there's been a lot of rain. The river has actually come up and subsided again really quickly, which tells us something about what this river and what its drainage line is, is really like. It's got a really sharp increase with a really sharp drop off. So there the water raised up. You can see where it flooded across the sandbank last night. And then it has dropped again throughout the day. There's a big crocodile there. It did bring with it another carcass. Now yesterday, for those of you who are watching, we saw three carcasses come down the river. I don't know if this was one of them. I doubt it. I think this is probably a new one. A wildebeest carcass, which is washed up on the, on the sandbanks there and which would at some, will at some point be devoured by crocodiles either in this pool or further down the stream. Isn't it just amazing how this river is so temperamental? It is amazing. Kenya is in the grips of a drought at the moment, and from what I'm told from colleagues of mine, that this river is about half the height of what it should be. It should be halfway up that bank. That is the height that it should be at the moment for this time of the year. Isn't that incredible? A half the water. Now, let's go to Dusty Crossing, if we could. There is Dusty Crossing, and at Dusty Crossing, we've got a crocodile that probably throughout the course of the evening moved into this position that you see right now and, uh, and has been lying there for the day. It's probably been out of the weather for, for, this, for this croc, which has allowed it to maintain a pretty decent body temperature i'm sure because wind is not going to be kind excuse the freezing that we're getting from the camera at the moment with all the uh moisture in the air whoopsie camera's on a rogue mission uh, all right let's go over to uh, main south while dusty gets itself under control again what happens is we lose signal with these cameras and uh and from time to time one goes on a rogue mission like you see over there now and doesn't get the signal to turn around or to switch off. So what we can see at Main South Crossing is a hammercorp bird, which is not all that unusual. Hammercorp birds are fairly common out here, but you hardly ever get to see them on these cameras. They tend to be pool or, or um, more pool dwellers, where they use their feet and their beak to try and hunt for invertebrates. And I think what's happened with this particular river is as it's come up, it's brought with a whole bunch of insects. And as it's subsided again, those insects have taken refuge in detritus. And the hammercorp has now come into that detritus to try and glean itself a dinner or a supper. Right now, just waterproofing its feathers. It's a heron. You can see that fancy feathered headdress that gives it its name, hammer, hammerhead bird. It's also, I've also heard it referred to in English as a lightning bird. A hammerkop means hammerhead, and it's the Dutch, or I suppose Dutch, German, Afrikaans, um, Flemish description of this particular bird. But at the moment, we just, I'll just call it a lightning bird. And the reason for that is that the local guys in the Kruger National Park, the local Shangan guys, believe that if this, ne if this bird builds a nest in a tree above your house, that it's going to cause lightning to strike there. In any case, why don't we go and have a look at Scott, who's got a fantastic sunset to show you. Well, is this not absolutely breathtaking? Manu has worked his magic on this camera, and the sun has worked its magic to break through what is a very, very cloudy and somewhat drizzly afternoon in the Masai Mara. You can possibly hear the drizzle pitter pattering down on top of our circus tent. We have half opened the tent, and as we did that, it started raining again, but we've positioned ourselves with our bottom towards
the wind, well, in the, in the direction the wind's coming from. So most of the rain is hitting the closed back half of the vehicle and the front half of the vehicle other than my back. And this little section here, you can see a few spots of rain have made it into the car, but not many, just to here. <laughs> So the wind is coming from basically behind us and it's not ideal because we're trying to go in that direction. I suggested to Mono we could possibly reverse all the way there and just give you shots along the way because putting the flaps up and down takes a little bit of time. But it stopped so we can continue. Woohoo! I really do love that bird that you're looking at with Steph, the hummercorp. They're one of my favorite birds to watch hunting. They are great hunters. They use their toes to detect their prey. And it sounds like birds are on the menu this afternoon because Byron is also searching for birds. Oh, we need to stop because the sun's even looking better now. Sorry. <laughs> Let's just have, show you a quick look. There's, oh no, I'm not used to the circus circus tent. Let me swivel a bit more. Okay, now Manu should be able to get the majority of that ray that is really looking quite beautiful. That's bursting through on the left. Magic. Okay, well, let's try that again. I hope Byron doesn't have a bird that's ready to flitter away because that would be a great pity if that was the case. He is on an incredible quest to try and reach 100 birds, as I'm sure he's told you. I'm hoping he does succeed. He's nearly there. Why don't you go and see what he's found? All right, so we are trying to continue our bird watching. However, our patience has paid off. They found a male leopard earlier. Now we're going to go and join that sighting. One of the other guides managed to find a male leopard. He's lying in the Muwati. So I'm hoping we get a nice view of him. I'm not sure who it is yet, but let's go and have a look. I'm very excited. We're not too far. We're almost down in the drainage line. So this is going to be... Um, quite spectacular i hope he might be lying down in the thicket but we'll sit and spend time with him maybe we get to see him moving around the wind again has picked up substantially and it's actually quite chilly now it's not very pleasant i'm looking forward to getting down into this drainage line maybe we'll have a bit of cover um i just need to work out what our best approach is I know they did, I think he's down in the drainage line somewhere. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go downstream in the Mulawati from this area over here. All right, well, let me head down here and see if I can get a bit closer to this, um, this leopard. And while I do that, let's go across to Steph, who's watching some elephant. There's an elephant that is uh, just crossing the river at Dusty Crossing, but uh, unfortunately Dusty Crossing's camera is still a bit errant. We're losing and gaining signal from Dusty Crossing's camera, and of course I lose and gain the ability to control it from a couple of miles away. But it'll be nice, I think I'm just going to leave this one in shot. Have a look at this elephant. He's obviously feeling with his trunk the bottom of the, of the riverbed to make sure that he doesn't fall into any holes. But just look at this, completely at home. Gives you an idea of how deep the river actually is. A big bull elephant like this, we could, ah, oh, there's a nice cool drink. A big bull elephant like this, I could probably walk underneath the front of his armpits. That's how tall he is. Maybe just brushing the top of my head, but around about six feet tall underneath his, uh, his armpits. You can see the tree in the background there, shaking in the wind, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, wind down in this valley at the moment and uh, Alice tells me that there's a lot of you out there that are, are, uh, are enjoying and are excited to see an elephant. It's quite rare to see an elephant in this river, I must be honest with you, it's not a very common thing at all. What are you doing boy, why are you digging around there with your trunk? There he goes right down in there, I wonder if he's going to have a swim. Do you think he's gone into the, there's a hippo giving a bit of a yawn and that's just the hippo saying this is my patch, please just leave it alone. It's just hippos. They're massively insecure hippos, to be honest with you. No, 
Roshni, you're 100% right. Those hippos are never really happy, but they suffer from a big inferiority complex, I think. We always have to show people how angry they are, thrash around and make a big noise. Oh, look how deep that elephant's gone. How awesome is that? Wow. That river's a lot deeper in that particular point than I gave it credit for, I must be honest with you. Come, go for a swim, Ellie. Surely you want to have a bit of a swim. I love YouTube. You've just asked me. <laughs> what a fantastic name. Uh, you've just asked me if uh, those hippos would, uh, would mess with that elephant. No, they wouldn't. The hippos suffering from their big inferiority complex know that they'd be outmatched with an elephant. And even th aggressive things like white rhinoceros, I have seen elephant, even youngsters, kill. Elephant have got the advantage of, of, uh, of, um, of height and with those big trus tusks and trunk, basically just lean on the saddle of anything smaller than them and will break their backs. That was absolutely special to see, don't you think? And from a and from a camera that is busy playing up at the moment. Let's see where this Ellie goes. He's just going to walk up the bank over there. There, it gives you an idea of how deep it is. Um, if I fit underneath these armpits, that would probably be where my elbows are if I had to lift my elbows above my head. That's how deep the water was. So fairly deep, actually, at that particular point. And as you can see, elephant not worried about it in the absolute least. There. As the water joins the bank by the rocks, you'll see a white-necked bird that is a grey heron. That is, uh, that, excuse me, I've got hiccups. <laughs> wow. Trying to deal with that. Um, and that is a grey heron. Other than the black-necked heron, which is, uh, which is common on the grassy plains, this particular heron quite often hunts the river's fringes for frogs and for crabs and for other invertebrates. The wind is pumping down this riverbed at the moment. Why don't we go and have a look at Main North, just so that we can finish having a look at exactly how much water actually came down. That is a nice view of the rapid at Main North. I definitely think that a wildebeest or zebra crossing here now would be washed down. And I'm wondering if it's gonna change what they perceive as being a possible crossing point or not. There's rain now falling at Kildesac Crossing, and it hasn't started to fall. It looks like the rocks are wet, though. It looks like it might be falling there where we're at. That is incredible, huh? Is it difficult to actually gauge where these storms are going? I don't know the exact twists and turns of this river, and the reason for that is that we don't yet have access to walking around this river, and it would have been the first thing that I would have done is walk the banks of this river to find out exactly where all the twists and turns are, how far the cameras are from one another, where they're going, what's the river doing, where all the little secret places, that's for sure. All right, why don't we go and have a look at the whew, cul-de-sac crossing. Let's go and see what those hippo are doing. <laughs> Sometimes there's just too much to choose from over here. A cul-de-sac crossing is, is my favorite crossing. Not only is it on the, uh, on the banks of the river as it exits the forest. So there's a huge forest um, that, is, that is part of the Mara River and it peters out right at cul-de-sac crossing. And so I find it quite a, for lack of a better word, I suppose a romantic crossing. It's just got the forest on the one side. It's got a huge big palm tree on the other. It's... Uh, it's, it's a lovely crossing, it's quite peaceful, but it, it doesn't speak to the fact that we've seen mass murder at this crossing on a scale that you don't even understand. We've seen drownings, couple of, a couple of uh, uh, dozen wildebeest, 60, 70 wildebeest drowning. Let's go and see what these are in the tree over there. They look like vultures. We see thousands upon thousands of animals cross at this crossing, more often crossing here than anywhere else. Yep, those are vultures. Let's see if we can see what types of vultures. They're just weathering out the storm. Let's see if we can ID these vultures. Uh, the most common of the vultures I'd show is the white-backed vulture. And I think these two on the left are the white-backed vulture. And I think they're all white-backed vultures. I don't know what this one is on this side, but looking very bedraggled. Anyway. Byron has finally found his leopard, and so we are going to be sending you across to him now. Enjoy yourselves. Oh. 
All right, now we've just caught a glimpse of this male leopard, and I think it's Singana. Hold on. Maybe we can see him through there. So before I move, or do you want me to move a bit further? Oh, is he going down the drainage? Yeah. Let's try and move a bit closer, everyone. Hold on. It looks like it's Tingana, beautiful big male. One of the, the dominant male leopard around here. There he is. I think we're going to get a nice view of him shortly. Hold on. He's right here, Seb. I'm just going to stop here because of the light. So as we can see his face, I think. Well, and there he is. Wonderful. Now, this is not the first time this week that we followed this male leopard through this drainage line. He seems to be enjoying this area at the moment. Look at that beautiful big dewlap as he's walking under the neck or the throat. That is lovely. Very, very nice. It's going to be tricky for us to follow him. I'm just trying to think. I don't know this drainage line that well, where there are little access points. It helps to know the area a bit better. Um, we're actually on the wrong side. Of, well, maybe not. Hold on. You never know. Oh, there we go. We can still get him through there, Seb. Is that all right? Yeah. Looks like he might cross down. You know, and I think I can get into the drainage line from here anyway, which is great. So this is a perfect spot for us if he does cross through. Look at that beautiful golden light. Perfect for photography. Um, that's an interesting Twitter handle. I'm sure it's not true. No one likes me. You said that um, the leopard looks like it's fed recently. This male. Oh, let's uh, try to see if we can get a better view. Hold on. Let's see if we can get another view of him. He's making it a little bit difficult for us at the moment. As usual, as leopards do. Hold on a second. Ah, there's an easier little gap for us. Well, this worked out quite nicely. There's a little gap for us to jump right back down into this drainage line. He's crossing though. Ha um, sorry, Sip. He's just crossing out of the... Um, you know, Seb, hold on, sorry, I'm going to move quickly. Sorry, sorry. Um, I'm going to go around everyone. I'm going to get him, try catch him on the road on the other side. Uh. Hold on. It's, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry, we'll go around the so we don't have to bend the aerial. Some, some thick sand, that's always fun. <laughs> Sorry little Franklin, the crested Franklin. Out here quickly, we're on this road now. And we should see that male coming out now. I hope he doesn't continue to that drainage line off to the right. That's where we followed him the other day, and it was incredibly thick. Very difficult to stay with him. I can see him straight ahead of us. So I'm going to get a lovely view of him shortly. Oh, I think it was the right plan for us to come out and... Um, and view him over here. Oh, sorry, you said there's actually a hold here. Um, oh, there he goes. Wow, look at that. He does look like he's fed. He does look like he's fed. His stomach looks quite full. That's wonderful. Or fairly full. It's just 
disappearing there quickly. Hold on a second. Afternoon everyone. There we go. That's a nice view of him. See again that golden light and he's backlit at the moment. So I think photographers would have a wonderful time with this male leopard right now. I'm smelling the air, looking around. That is a lovely view of this male. I'm trying to think. Uh, Seb, when last did we see Tingana? It was three, four days ago, three days ago? I haven't seen him in a while. Um, yeah, so about three days ago, just before um, Senzo went on leave, um, we found Tingana, so it was, it's nice to see him again. Now, Mr. P, you were asking, what is that big dewlap for that we can see on his throat? So I'm just going to reverse a little bit here, just to give uh, the other vehicle a, a chance to see this leopard. There we go, I'm sure that should be fine for them. And um, so, Mr. P, that dewlap is... Uh, the theory behind the dewlap is... Sorry, hold on. Thanks, Seb. I'm um, sorry, Mr. P, that dewlap, the theory is that that thick um, skin around the neck um, will hopefully protect that leopard almost in a similar way that a mane protects the male lion. Um, but the dewlap, I think that loose skin, thicker skin around the neck will protect the neck from fights. That's one theory. Makes it look bigger, stronger, hopefully intimidate the other leopard. But that is a beautiful big dewlap on that male leopard. Oh, now he is going into that drainage line. We followed him the other day, which was very difficult. We'll see, maybe we can still get a view. Good, good. As you can see, there's some uh, Franklin that he's startled over there. Uh, let's see if we can stick with him. I think we're going to lose him again, everyone, because this block, we drove through it and it was almost impenetrable. Here he is. He's just off through here. Seb down here. We might get a view through this gap. There he goes, there he goes. Now, notice again, the tail held up high. These Franklin's alarm calling at him at the moment. Now, we spoke about this the other day. Why do leopards do this? Now, the theory is that they raise their tail, makes themselves more visible, and it's to show that they're not a threat. That they, sorry, so, so that they're no danger. Um, to whatever it is that's alarm calling at them. And I've heard that, um, well, I've seen it many times, and it's not just when their birds alarm calling. Oh, wow, look at that. There's beautiful light on him again. Um, I'm just going to drop down here, quick, Seb. going to come through here. Seb, I think if it's all right, can I sit here? Let's just wait, everyone. He's going to come right past us, I think. And so as I was saying, they lift their tail, makes themselves more visible, and that they, um, they then uh, basically saying they're not a threat, they're, they're not hunting, and they're just passing through. I'm going to keep quiet, listen to him walk past us. It's amazing, look at that, nice and close, walked right in front of us, beautiful view of him. Uh, David, you asked, is that tail raising a learned, learned or a instinctive behavior? Now David, I think, I think it's instinctive, I don't think it's learned. 
No, we might we might lose this leopard, I wonder. I just don't know if he's going to lie down or if he's going to continue moving through that area. I, if he does continue moving, we're probably not going to be able to follow him anymore. It's amazing how this male leopard, how this male leopard is moving around so much in the afternoon but I think because it's nice and cool that is why it's probably still moving around I'm gonna try to get out of here quickly while I do let's go across to Steph who's still on those damn cams sorry river cams <laughs> isn't it just wonderful to see Tingana again I haven't seen a leopard in more than half a year more than half a year and I haven't been in a winter for an entire year and I think that that in itself is both uh, wonderful and depressing in a way um, and just shows you how different these places actually are from one another you've gone from a cold winter's afternoon to a very cloudy sort of equatorial dry season sky there uh, from main main uh, south and we've got some action going on all over these cameras let's go to cul-de-sac quickly um, where a group of wire-tailed swallows are just hiding out of the wind and they they tend to come and then basically just flap away again so it gives us this nice view of these absolutely beautiful swallows just have a look at that males and females and immature uh, swallows at the moment and uh, one of the fairly common swallows next to the brown martin or common martin that you see the brownish bird that you see over there and that's just lo lovely and they all come in here just for a bit of a rest out of the wind and then they uh, they take flight again and go and catch some insects that are starting to mass over the Mara River that's how close they are to the camera that doesn't even want to focus on it there you go come on camera you can do it <laughs> all right now I've, there's an unanswered question from yesterday. We ran out of light and we, we ran out of camera before I could answer Christy's question yesterday about the breeding season of crocodiles. So if I could ask that we go over to Dusty Crossing. Um, and what we've got at Dusty Crossing is two enormous crocodiles busy sunning themselves in the last bit of the sun, well, whatever sun is left, uh, right next to a washed up crocodile carcass but what this does allow me to do is talk a little bit about the breeding which is what Christy asked about yesterday Christy asked last night when do crocodiles lay eggs when is their breeding season I can answer that now that I've read the uh, probably about 500 words that I have at my disposal on crocodiles on the Nile crocodile at least anyway um, mating will happen anywhere from about May uh, through to August where male crocodiles will become territorial with one another and then they will, they will vie for the attentions of the females. Females will start to ovulate, they then submit to the males who mate with them and eggs are laid in November. And after quite a short gestation period, only 90 days, I had it wrong yesterday, I thought that it was about a year, but only after about 90 days, what happens is the eggs will hatch the mom sets up a bit of a nursery. She won't move for the three months that, the, that, she, that she looks after her eggs, basically. She doesn't even eat. She just looks after those eggs, keeping them safe from would-be predators. And, uh, and then she carries them gently in her mouth down to the nursery area in, the, in, the, in the, the river itself. And there for a couple of days, basically just looks after them and makes sure that they're okay. So all of that happens in that, uh, in that time. Andrew, you wanted to know how crocodiles see under the water. Um, that's actually quite a good question there, Andre. The, the, they've got a, a nictitating membrane, which is there to wipe off debris off of, their, off of their eyes. But what it also does is, it, like a pair of swimming goggles, it adds a separation between the eyeball and the actual water medium. And that separation allows crocodiles to see relatively well underwater. I mean... In murky water, they're not going to be able to see well at all. And I think that in actual fact that crocodiles use a series of pits on their, on their faces. Let me just slow that down. Uh, these crocodiles are a bit far away. That's the maximum zoom I have. But on a crocodile's head, even on, on the skull, there's a series of pits in their scales, which I think are very effective 
either electrochemical or chemical or electrical uh, sensors that can sense movement underneath the water. And I think they use their muzzle. Quite often you see even on the surface, a crocodile will put his top jaw on the surface, let the water rush past, and then very ably pick out movement and go and nuzzle it, just nudge it with, it with its nuzzle. They don't lick it, they just nudge it with their, with their nuzzle. And I think that they can actually... Uh, you know, I've never seen a, uh, a report on it. This is just obviously all my very uneducated, observational-based stuff based on, you know, six months of looking at this river. Nothing much really is what I'm trying to say, but <laughs> just an observation. Let's go to Main North, if you don't mind. We've got two hippos having a bit of a clash there. There we go. That's a pod of hippo, one of the largest pods of hippo that stay on the river. This is from Main North. This is at the extreme range of the camera at Main North. And, uh, and this pot of hippo don't like each other. You can see there a bit of a clash going on with these hippos. Often I watch these hippos and they are almost always jumping around at one another, smashing their teeth against one another. You'd never say that they're friends with each other, hey? Now let's see, that's the bum reversing out of the water with a tail busy wagging. That is also a weird thing that these crocodiles do. It is incredible. Anyone picks its head up, that's just a form of agitation, what they do. All right, I'm going to keep my eye on these, uh, on, these, uh, on these hippo. Scott is mobile again, and the rain seems to have passed and has a surprise for you. We certainly do have a surprise for you. This is going to be an epic view. I don't want to get in. Fr I do want to get in front of him, but I also do want to give you an opportunity to see this young male lion stroll past those palm trees. That's not your usual scene. There's not many palm trees here in the Mara. Beautiful. A young male. Who knows if he has any brothers or other coalition members nearby. You can see he's looking quite cautiously ahead, and the reason why he will be cautious is that unless he is one of Scar's sons, this is Scar's territory, and Scar is a big, big male lion that will not tolerate youngsters unless they are his own. And you can see this youngster certainly moving quite slowly and cautiously, stopping, listening, hello. Very happy to have found you. Beautiful young male, I'm guessing around maybe three to four years of age. Hello, Denise. Woohoo! Correct. Good that we found a lion and good that the rain stopped. So things are looking promising. We are going to have to reposition though, he's about to disappear behind some vehicles. I wonder what his movements are going to be. He may try and cross the Mara River. The Mara River is literally 100 meters over to our right-hand side, very close by. Failing that, he may just go for a drink. Time will tell. And I've got some other wonderful, wonderful news. Our quest to go and find Scar this afternoon could well prove successful because I did get a report that he is somewhere fairly nearby. So that is some very good news that we can look forward to. Looking for and not far from here. We are at I think a place called Cul-de-Sac Crossing where we've got one of our river cameras and he is going to be further downstream from here, somewhere near Main Crossing. Anyway, in the meantime, while we reposition, which I think is actually going to be right now, uh, yeah, let's just wait here and enjoy this, actually, because he is going to come straight towards us. We're going to get a good low angle, and after this, I'm not sure what our views will be like. We've ducked into a little drainage furrow, so we should get some great views as he parades through this grass. That is, of course, if he continues in the direction he was moving in, which would lead him straight to us. But you can see he's sniffing around quite intently. I wonder what he's looking for. I wonder if he hasn't maybe left a kill nearby here. He's definitely found something that has caught his attention. What is it you're looking for, mister? Hmm could well be the sense of other lions if he Fleming grimaces, which means he'll curl up his lip and grimace, baring his teeth almost like he's smiling. That would 
indicate that it's probably other lions that he's smelling. The fact that he's just got his nose to the ground seems to me like he could be on the trail of something to eat. I haven't seen them phlegm and grimace when on the trail of something to feed on. Huh, I've lost track of him from where I'm sitting <laughs> in this long, long grass. Oh, what an awesome scene is this. Okay, I'm going to have to reposition again. Hello, Vegas beauty snob. You would like to know if I think the lions in the Mara are more toned and well built than the lions in the Sabi Sands. And uh, possibly, I would have to put them together to be able to make a an educated de decision. Yes, yeah, certainly some. I mean, the biggest lioness I've ever seen is in the Mara, and some of the most impressive males I've ever seen are in the Mara, but that's not to say that all of them are necessarily bigger and stronger and more handsome than the Sabi Sands males or the South African male lions. I guess you do need to be quite specific, so I guess we'll say the Kruger lions. Looks like we may get just one more view of him as he disappears into this thicket. A beautiful, beautiful young male, and it'll be interesting to see what he turns into in the coming years. He's still got another two or three years before he will be in his prime as a guess, but he certainly is looking like he could become an absolute beaut of a male lion. Wonderful. Well, sadly, this is where the road ends, so we are not going to be able to follow him any further. And to be honest, I'm not too concerned about that because he is very close to a big male lion called Scar, like I said a little bit earlier, and I would desperately like to show you him. <clears throat> Okay, well, while we go and look for one of the most impressive big male lions in Africa, and certainly in the Maasai Mara, we will be sending you to one of the most impressive animals down south, a leopard. Now, can you spot the leopard, anyone? He's moved into a bit of a thicker area. He's just moved now. <laughs> just moved to the left. He was in there. Let's see, we might get a view of him again. Hold on a second, he's just moved behind that thick area. He's really giving us a bit of a run around at the moment. And Rocky, aged four, good afternoon Rocky, you were asking, um, do, do the leopards ever eat um, plants? Well Rocky, technically not. So leopards, leopards are carnivores, so they eat meat, but I have seen leopards go and chew on some grass from time to time, and the reason for that is it helps their digestive system. But generally speaking, they don't actually eat plants, they'll feed on meat. And that is what uh, what the leopards prefer feeding on Rocky. But just like um, if you've got pets at home, a, um, a dog or a cat, sometimes they eat grass it's to help their digestive system a little bit. Um, same with leopards. I have seen it before, but generally it's mainly meat that they eat. And fish. <laughs> sometimes, you know, we've seen them um, catch fish. Just looking, can you still see him, Seb? I'm gonna let me reposition. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. We'll see if we can get you a nice view of him. It's sometimes difficult to maneuver around like this, especially with him moving. He's been moving quite a lot, but maybe he decides. Uh, I've got a view of him. I've got a lovely view of him, actually. There we go. 
There we go. Hopefully, he stays here. Look at that. I think, I don't know if he spotted something in the bushes or if he heard something. He's been watching that direction quite intently. Now I'm just keeping a bit quiet because it's sometimes nice just to listen. Uh, maybe we hear something in the bushes ahead. It's also nice to hear some of the birds calling around us. There's an emerald spotted wood dove. But it's a nice peaceful sighting. Look at the beautiful rosettes, the, sp the pattern on the leopard, known as rosettes. R. Lara Moore, you say he is pulling off a sphinx pose. It does almost look like it, doesn't it? The sphinx in Egypt. I really do enjoy spending time with a big male leopard like this, a dominant male leopard. I'm trying to use my binoculars now just to see if I can see what he has spotted or what has caught his attention. I cannot see anything. It is so thick through there. Now what I don't understand is he actually came from that direction. so. Surely, if he walked past there, he would have seen whatever it is that's caught his attention now. But watch him, look at him. What has he spotted? Oh, this is very interesting. I wonder what it is. But you see, that's almost the stalking pose that he's taken up there now. He's sitting, but he's very curious about what is in front of him or in those bushes there. Kevin, you asked if I see a leopard breathing this hard, does it mean that he's on the trail of something? So not necessarily, Kevin. Um, I, th I think he's been moving around quite a bit. It, it's fairly warm, so I think he's just breathing heavily because it's, it's warm and he's been moving around quite a bit. He sounds like he's walked quite a distance already this afternoon. Just shows you how opportunistic these animals are. They'll move around during the day, regardless of the temperature at times. Let's just see. Look at the head dropping, those shoulders raised slightly. That is definitely a a posture that is taken up from time to time when they are intent on pouncing on something. Our leopard can move incredibly quickly when they do want to. Marisha, now you're asking about what is the bird that we keep hearing in the background. Now, is it that? Something like that. That's the emerald spotted wood dove, Marisha. I think that's what you can hear. Oh, look at him go. Look at him. He's definitely stalking something. But what is it? What is it? I can't see. very interesting. I can't see anything. I can't see what is fixed on there. I'm 
still see him there. Yeah, see, look at that. We can't see, but amazing behavior. I wonder if you didn't hear something moving in that thicket. <clears throat> Take care, the leopards definitely have incredible eyesight, but their hearing is also very, very good. I'm just trying to have a look. Now, the other day we were um, in this area, sorry, take care, I'll get back to your question now, but the other day we were in this area, I mean, there's a lot of scrub hair in that, <clears throat> excuse me, that are, that are around and hiding in these thicker areas and these um, shrubs in between the grasses. So I wonder if he didn't perhaps Oh, all we need is for him to pose for us over there. Maybe he'll sit on this mound. That would be wonderful. Lovely yawn. He's walking straight towards us. He is a beautiful male. Now, take care. His eyesight is very good, but their sense of hearing is also good. I do think, I don't know, I think their eyesight would be slightly better than their hearing. Um, it's difficult to say. Now, he's going to be moving behind us. As he does that, we'll reposition. All right, he's going back onto the road. That's nice for us. At least it makes it a bit easier for us to follow him. All right, he's going to disappear behind us. I'll reposition quickly. Thanks, Seb. Well done. That was awesome. Hey, what a lovely sighting. This is so great. <laughs> and Peyton, you say hopefully he's stalking gremlins. And um, so I'm just seeing some people behind us. Um, yeah, you'd say he'd love to see him tear a gremlin apart. Definitely. <laughs> is on the road in front of us there is another vehicle here too so we'll give them a chance um, luckily for us we've got the camera so we don't have to be too close to him he's just in the road up ahead um, just give us a second he's moving I'm going to allow one of the other vehicles who's just arrived in the sighting to also come past and get a view um, just so that they may see it too. Um, we've had such a nice view and like I said with the camera it's very nice and a bit easier for us. So we'll just let them move past and get a view. But while we do that let's head back to the Mara and to my friend James. I wonder how he's doing in that storm that they've just had. Well it was a bit of a damp squib really the storm. Uh, it uh, stopped us, certainly, and we put our covers on, but it then just sort of drizzled a bit. Anyway, we had a cup of coffee in our tent, and now it's cleared up a bit, and so we're carrying on. The cats we're going to are just along here, I hope. They've been very kind to us over the last few days. They've spent all day in amongst a little rocky area, and then as the sun's gone down, they've sort of gone on the hunt, so that's what we're hoping for. But yesterday evening, these plains were full of prey for them to eat and now that seems to have changed so it'll be interesting to see what they do and yesterday i was asked a question it was a very good one and that was basically do the lions focus more on hunting during the time when the migration is not here and i think they do absolutely and i think now these lions which i don't think have eaten for two or three days probably get up and have to think quite a lot more carefully about what it is that they're going to do and hunt this evening. Anyway, we'll see what happens. We have seen one very slight, well, slightly distressing little scene of a newborn wildebeest calf, well, newborn, seven months old, and it was just on its own. It's obviously got separated and lost. I'm afraid, Phoebe, I didn't hear your question. Can we have it again, Alice? Why doesn't the Mara have leopards? It does, Phoebe. The Mara absolutely has leopards. But we tend not to move around in the areas that are ideal for leopards. And they will be on the drainage line areas and the dry riverbeds. And they will be up on the mountains mostly. 
and very seldom. I mean, I've seen at least three. I've seen a leopard actually right around here. I've seen three or four young wildebeest hanging from trees, which tells me that there are leopards in the plains regardless, but they will live in the luggers. And it's interesting, most of the roads of the area actually don't go along the drainage line areas. They tend to sort of cut through the grasslands because those are more sensitive, or at least less sensitive areas, and they're much easier to maintain from a road management point of view. So that's the story there, but there absolutely are leopards here. Do they occur in the same density as Tingana and his ilk? I think probably not. So let's head straight back to Tingana. Uh, Byron is sitting with him now, and I'm sure you're all most relieved that there has been a small season break in the birding saga. Now uh, we have got another view of Tingana again. Let's move through this drainage line. What scent marking? Now these leopards, big dominant male like this, will scent mark quite or fairly regularly. Listen. Oh, do you hear that territorial roar? Wonderful. I haven't had that live on camera. That was wonderful. Did you get that, everyone? It was just that. Oh, there's some in, in, in Yala running off. Yeah, it looked like a Nyala. Do you hear that, uh, that wonderful um, roar? That <laughs> I don't do it very well. <laughs> Not as well as he does it. Van, you asked when leopards are more active during the day or during the night. Um, well, to be honest, mainly, mainly nocturnal or mainly at night. Um, let's just see if I can get a view here quickly. Oh, I don't know where he went. He walked down that way. Um, I'm just going to stick around here for a second to see if we get some movement. It's very thick. We can't get through here anyway, through this drainage line. But there is a road on the other side, not too far. Maybe he comes out there. One of the other vehicles drove around. So we'll stick around here and just see if he turns and comes back. Traman, um, leopards are generally nocturnal. They mainly move around at night. However, they do move around during the day too. And a lot of people are, are unaware of that. They think they're only move at night but just as it shows and this is not the first time this male leopard's done this the other day too three o'clock in the afternoon we found him moving around in this area so they do move around a lot during the day can you hear the guinea uh, i was going to say guinea fowl the franklin's calling alarm calling oh hang on let's go across to scott who's apparently got lions calling and it is calling it is not the lion we are looking for it could be one of his girlfriends I'm almost certain it is and I can hear roaring from another lion where I think Scar could be so she was roaring to the north of her to the left of her there was another one roaring and now a third one has roared in the direction we have come from and I just got a very brief updates as to where Scar could be and I think it could be closer to the river so maybe he was replying to one of his ladies certainly looking good though they are singing for us and the fact that they are singing allows us to know that there are more than one and hopefully that they are planning on reuniting here we go again another one's roaring in the distance zoom into her I'm sure she's gonna start You can see she's listening. I'm not sure if you can hear it. You may very faintly be able to hear the call of a lion. I think there's two or three lionesses that hang around in this general area. And maybe it's just the three of them trying to reunite. reunite. Maybe they're interested in seeing old Scar. Time will tell. Now, this is one of the areas where we cannot off-road. So we cannot get closer 
to her than this for now, but hopefully she will come to us and not head to that other lion that's just been roaring. She looks quite hungry. That's useful to know. I certainly do love watching lions attempting to capture their prey, as I'm sure a lot of you do as well. And at the moment, the likelihood of finding a lion that is not bloated is quite slim. To be honest though, most of the migratory herds haven't been moving through this area too much. Hello Roshni, you'd like to know if Scar is the only male within this area or does he have a coalition that he is a part of and he is part of a coalition of I'm told three males. I think they are called the musketeers so it can be a little bit confusing that there's a coalition of male lions called the musketeers as well as the fact that there's a coalition of five male cheetahs called the musketeers. Speaking of which, I'm thinking of possibly heading across to their neck of the wilderness tomorrow afternoon to spend a couple of days with them if we are lucky enough to have them in the reserve and not in the surrounding conservancies where we do not spend any time. They do go there quite a lot. We've just been incredibly lucky that when I've been across there in search of them, they've been in the right place. So that's the plan for tomorrow afternoon. If any of you are hoping on seeing a cheetah, make sure you tune in. Hi Ali, you'd like to know how far can a lion hear the roar of another lion? And if we can hear their call from about five miles away in good weather conditions, then I'm guessing they could hear from maybe 20 kilometers. I would say their hearing's at least four times better than ours. But that's just a guess, so cannot be certain of that. Marvelous. Now she's headed into an area where we cannot go but that is fine because I want to go and have a look for the lion that was roaring behind us which I'm hoping is going to be Uncle Scar okay so shame I'm told Byron managed or Mvula rather managed to dodge Byron but he is still hot on the trail trying to get you some more views of him so why don't you go and see how it's going Scott, sounds like you had a lovely lion sighting. Now, haven't seen this leopard again. Excuse me, he, um, he's disappeared in through this dense thicket. So we're going to try and have a, a look around here. I, I mean, it's difficult because this leopard's been changing direction a lot. But just have a look at how thick it is here, everyone. It's very, very thick. We drove through here the other day trying to follow this male. And now with it getting a bit darker it's impossible to get through here we would be wasting our time but I'm hoping I can still hear those Franklin calling but I don't think they see him anymore I, I'm not sure I think he would have walked through already and I'm hoping that maybe we like and he comes out further south of where we are at the moment so I'm just gonna drive around here and see maybe we get another glimpse of him but that was such a great sighting it's always I think, you know, I always say it, but we're so lucky to be able to follow a big male leopard like this and see him moving around. Hope, good afternoon to you. You are 10 years old and hope you want to know how far away can a leopard hear. Well, I hope a leopard, I don't know how far they can actually hear, but I think we can probably, if I think of what we can hear, um, a leopard can probably hear uh, probably about, um, I'm trying to think, maybe three or four kilometers away, you could probably hear a leopard call. Um, now, what's that in miles? Let's say, um, let's call it two and a half miles away, probably, maybe three miles away. You can hear a leopard call. I can hear an owl actually. Let's see if I can find it. <laughs> now if we can hear a leopard call at that distance, I'm sure I'm sure other leopards would be able to hear it um, even further away. So I but I don't know, I hope it's it's difficult. I don't think we really know how far it can be heard. 
but I would say, yeah, I think four kilometers, it's about one, one point six miles, two miles, maybe. We're going to take our time. Let's see if I can find this owl. Hold on. Hold on. I can hear it. Oh, if I spot the owl. Wait, I can hear it everyone, it's close. Let's see if we can find it. <laughs> this is always exciting. A little pearl spotted owl. Let's stop here for a second and see. Tricky, I think now. To spot this little owlet, I needed to call again for us. I'm sure it would have been on one of these trees. But what a beautiful view! The colours in the sky, that pink and purple and blue. <laughs> Lovely colors. Where is this little owlet? It's gone very quiet now. Look at the moon. It's going to be full moon fairly, fairly soon. Now the owl has decided to go completely quiet. I'm also, you know what the nice thing is, is I'm waiting here to see if that leopard pops out again. So sometimes we will um, stop and listen for birds or try to look at birds, but we also looking and listening for little birds like these owls. Oh, sorry, <laughs> we also stop here and looking for the animals like the leopard or lion or whatever it might might be all right well i i can't find this owl at the moment let's uh let's head across to james who has found a lion and will continue our search for our leopard. We have found the lions. There they are, sitting in amongst the rocks, as predicted they would be. This one, uh, well, I wouldn't say caught in the most elegant pose. There we are, young male. But there is very little around here for them to eat, so I'm going to be fascinated to know what it is they do as the night gets going. Now they're doing their kind of typical slowly waking up thing. Cleaning, then off, often they doze off for a little while and then slowly they'll get up to move as the darkness really starts to build. And it's become quite dark quite quickly tonight on account of the fact that there is obviously thick cloud over the top of us. Now you're not going to see me anymore because we have this special low light camera on and its lens is a bit too long to be reaching where I'm sitting. Ecula, you're wondering if thunder and lightning will come. Well, yes, it could. Certainly last night it came. There was much thundering, there was much lightninging, there was very little rain, though. Um, so it could certainly come, but there's been very little in the way of thunder this evening. There has been the odd kind of rumble but there haven't really been a storm so much as a, a gentle front moving over. A very unusual, well, I mean, unusual in my humble experience, which is not extensive for this area, not to have a kind of crashing storm, but just a gentle drizzle. That's what we had. I'm 
Let's just look how well fed they are because now that the herds are not around here at the moment, their desire to hunt may well be fueled by hunger rather than the desire to actually hunt. And that is a fat male. He's had a lot to eat over the last little while. But they're going through the motions of the greeting, which is encouraging. It tells us perhaps they won't sleep quite as long as they did last night. Roshni, you want to know which of the big cats is my favorite? Um, Roshni, I don't have a particularly original answer to that. I'm afraid it is the leopard. Uh, I really enjoy leopards, especially on foot, uh, because they are, I don't know, they just give me the impression of intelligence. Like when they, when I look down the, the eyes of a lion, I see nothing but blankness. And uh, when I look into the eyes of a leopard, I feel like I'm sort of having my soul read, if you know what I mean. And that's especially the case if you're on foot. Uh, lions just don't give me the same impression. Obviously, I love them all. They're all, all wonderful creatures, and I appreciate every second that I spend with all of them. But my favorite would have to be the leopard. And my favorite leopard at the moment, it does change from time to time, is Shongile, and I haven't seen her for a very long time, and I'm hoping or looking forward to seeing her again. Craig, there's a bit of action up front there. Is that the big male? What's going on there? That's the big male. Now, I think this is a really interesting thing because this big male here is, well, I don't know if it's related or if he's uh, the father of that one or if they've just set up a little coalition together. Perhaps time will tell. I believe that Byron has managed to have some success in the great birding saga, which tends to continue ad nauseum longer, uh, well, longer than a politician's speech, really. Let's hit across now. Uh, look, everyone, I don't think this is the owl that we heard, but it is an owlet nonetheless, a beautiful pearl-spotted owlet that we managed to find. Look, you can see those, as it turned its head, you could see the black markings very clearly on the back of its head, streaking down the chest. That is so nice. Seb, I wonder if I try roll forward a little bit. If maybe, don't worry, just hold it there. Oh, the vehicle won't move. Oh, there it goes, there it goes. There, maybe is that a bit better? Just through that gap. There we go, nice. I love seeing these little owls. We've been very fortunate in the last two weeks, actually a month I would say, spotting these little owls. The pearl spotted owlet, the African barred owlet and the scops owl, all very similar in size, very small, but they've all got wonderful calls, distinct calls that stand out in, in the evening. So another owl for us to enjoy. Now, Natalie, you asked what is the biggest prey that this owl could catch? Now, Natalie, it would probably be another bird of sorts. Um, let me see if there's sometimes in these in the books or the apps they will um, they will put a range of food that they've seen these owls feeding on it may may have been once not something that they feed on regularly but let's see if they've got something um yeah so birds and rodents lizards snakes bats interesting diet for these little owls but i would say probably a rodent or a bird is probably the largest type of prey that it would go for Naturable, you asked if I can do an owlet call. Well, you are in luck. I can indeed. <laughs> Shall we try, Seb? Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's see if I can do it for you. 
and hopefully it decides to call back so we can compare. <laughs> Yeah, do you see that? See if it calls back. That would be amazing. <laughs> and that's the pearl spotted owlet call at whistle. It's looking straight at me. Doesn't seem very impressed. Looks like it's judging me actually. Oh, heard an elephant in the distance. Angeline, you asked, what is my favorite owl? Um, it would have to be that little scops owl, I think. Beautiful little owl, and we always hear them at night. All the, but the, I mean, the giant eagle owl is beautiful. The spotted eagle owl is great. Actually, here the spotted eagle owls in Johannesburg see them often um, near our house, believe it or not, in the, just outside of the city. Um, yeah, these little pearl spotted owlets, the barred owlet, I, I don't know, I don't know. But that little scops owl is great, it's got a wonderful little call. Grr, grr, grr. Sounds exactly like that. See, I can do two owl calls. <laughs> I must have stopped down here yeah, just looking out for that leopard. Maybe it maybe it pops out and uh, and we see it before it crosses. It was heading south, that male leopard, so maybe we're lucky. Gulrez, you asked if the if all owls hover when hunting. Um, as far as I know, they don't. Uh, owls will fly and um, basically dive bomb, if I can put it that way. They'll dive bomb and and catch their prey. They don't hover. Travan, you asked if I've ever seen an owl hunt. I've never seen an owl hunt or an owl hunt. I've seen an owl feeding on something before, but never actually hunt. I went, there was some Franklin running under the under the um, tree, and that owl took a little look. But I think of Franklin would be a bit too big for this for this bird. I'm glad we got to show you an owl. I'm going to move on and see what else we can find. Let's head across to James and he's waiting for lions to hunt, not an owl. I am waiting for lions to hunt. I hope um, that they will get up and hunt. The waiting process has certainly been lengthy many, many times over the course of the last few weeks. And now that I do not hear the gnooing of the gnoos anywhere close to me, I fear me that it's going to be even longer. But their heads are up. Can we go a little bit around to the left-hand side there, Kragus, um, to the sort of over the top of my right shoulder? Is that where you were? There's my finger. Straight over there. Oh, the head's gone down again. No, nope. okay, there was a lioness up there. In the background you can see this, oh, that's what I wanted. She's listening very intently to something. So I don't know what she's listening to, but she's perfectly camouflaged in amongst the grass there. I can hear vaguely in the background one or two hyenas calling and I may have in the very far distance have heard a male lion. Chastity, you want to know if lions are going to hunt in a storm. Would they hunt in a storm? Yes, they would. If the opportunity presents itself, 
they will hunt in just about any conditions. But I suppose if the rain was really hard and really quite sort of uh, uncomfortably hard, then they are probably going to take cover underneath a bush rather than hunt. So they might do that, but there's certainly no... Well, it's getting pretty black off to the east, but uh, I'm not sure if that rain will reach us. These conditions and the drizzle that we had earlier will allow them to hunt, but we can't follow them on the hunt in the rain, unfortunately, because we'll get all this equipment wet, and then it will break, and then we will be sad because there will be no broadcast at all, ever. Now, that's our big male. I would put his age at around about seven, maybe even eight. See how he winked at me when I said eight? Definitely, that's how old he is. And I'm fascinated by the age of the other male. Like I said, two young males, actually. Both of them around about four, three and a half to four years old. Kimberly, you're wondering if the young male lions have to feed every day, if they have to eat every day. And Kimberly, the answer is no, absolutely not. These guys are still going to grow, but they're not sort of um, like ravenous human teenagers who will eat their parents out of house and home. But certainly they do need to eat probably more than the lionesses do and more than a big male does. But uh, they are, I mean, they don't have to eat every day. Certainly during them, they didn't eat yesterday and they still look very fat indeed. Life is very hard on a Sunday here. You see, you can see that they are they're rather exhausted, but they're also very satisfied with how the week has gone, lying on their backs and sweet repose as the sun has disappeared and night comes, which is, of course, their time. <laughs> Look at him. Costa, are you wondering which big cats live longer? Um, you know, the best figures for these come actually from zoos and from captivity, because in the wild we so very seldom actually know how long they live, and the records that we do have are so limited that to sort of extrapolate some kind of an average from them is, uh, is very difficult. But in a place like the Sabi Sand, for example, or the Mara, where the lions and leopards are, are well, the, certainly the lions and the cheetah are known very well. You'll find that the average male lion lives to around about 10 years, up to 16 though, they have a potential lifespan of 16. So it's still dominant at Londolozi in the southern parts of the, or well, central parts of the Sabi Sand until they were 16, the famous Sparta males. Then they, there, were, there have been leopards in the Sabi sand that we have no, but we certainly know one of at least lived to 17 and possibly another to 18. Those are females, uh, males oldest probably 14 or so. And so, yeah, you know, on average, I'd say a leopard probably lives longer than a lion. A lioness probably seldom gets beyond sort of 12, 13, maybe 14 years if she's very, very lucky. So I'm going to say leopards, I think, are the longest lived. Cheetah potentially in captivity could live as long but I think out here you know a cheetah's life is one of is a very risky one and I think for them to reach the ripe old age of 12 or 13 would be unusual this line is rather like yesterday very intently looking around wondering what perhaps there is on the menu for this evening is it going to be wildebeest stroganoff is it going to be zebra sausages? Is it perhaps going to be impala stew? Who knows? And Denise, as you say, what a beautiful scene. Well, that is inescapably true. And I think I can hear a nightjar calling. I'm not sure which one it is, but it keeps going. I'm sure you can hear it doing that every so often. You're going to need to go into infrared. Does, what does that mean, Craig? Okay, so do we need to link away or can we stay here? No. Right, we're going to go across to Byron. He was searching with his uh, flash headlight thing. So we're going to put this camera into infrared and when you see us next, we will be in black and white. <laughs> uh, no, we just 
got our spotlights out and we're having a look for any nocturnal animals. Maybe we have some luck tonight. We were lucky last night. And last night we had a wonderful bush baby. And um, who knows, maybe some more owls. I've said to Sebastian, not to worry, we are going to find honey badgers. Um, I think I've uh, bitten off a little more than I can chew with that promise. But who knows, maybe, imagine we find some honey badgers now. I'd be very happy. It's a beautiful evening here tonight. Um, there's, uh, look at the color in the sky. That golden silhouette that we've got at the moment of the trees. It really is beautiful. Wonderful colors. Apparently it's about 22 degrees Celsius, 72 degrees Fahrenheit. I think it's a bit colder than that. Our weather station is not very reliable, as we've said. I don't know, I wonder where we get that reading from. I need to find out. Perhaps go turn the thermometer down a little bit. <laughs> it's a white-browed scrub robin that we can hear calling next to us. Hold on. Sorry, there we go. Natalie, there are um, not necessarily fewer chameleons, but what happens is they, because there are reptiles, there's not a lot of food around for them. You don't see many of them around. They do conserve the energy, so they'll go into hiding almost, in a state of almost estivation. Um, oh, hang on, those lines, I think that James has got it roaring. Let's go and listen to that. Well, they were. Well, they're still going a little bit. There we go. Young male roaring, which is very cool. Uh, the big guy started it, and then the youngsters began, and then the females went too. Let's go across to them quickly, if we can, to the right. And you can see we're now in full infrared. And they're in there somewhere. A whole bunch of them started yelling. And it's often a precursor to movement, but just distressingly, it's often not a precursor to hunting. Let's see if they do it again. It was really very special to hear. She's up and she's listening. Uh, all very well fed. So we'll see a slight limp there on her front left foot. Very slight wouldn't affect her in a hunt, but certainly you can see she is favoring the right front. Where is she going? Farm to the males. Now, I, you see, I'm watching the screen now exactly the same as you, so often I can't tell where on earth they are. I have to watch my screen. I'm just going to try and extricate myself out of this very large rock field. If they do start to move, she's at 12 o'clock. No, she's at about oh, two, eh? Um, no, one, two. And often they move just a little bit away, which is quite polite of them. Heather, you're wondering if lions are nocturnal. Um, yes, they are nocturnal to some extent. Most animals out here are largely crepuscular, which means they're active dawn and dusk. But certainly, uh, lions move towards the nocturnal. You know, we've spent a lot of time with them all night over the last sort of three months or so. And quite often what you find... Are they going to call again? Oh, well, she's calling now. She might set the others off. What we found is that they will often sleep from sort of 11 o'clock till 5 o'clock in the morning. 
sometimes even longer. That's more a contact call than a territorial one. Natalie, as the lightning flashes there, you say, does it make any of the animals scatty? Uh, do you mean mad by scatty or do you mean scared? I don't, I think it makes them afraid sometimes, definitely. I think thunder certainly makes them afraid from time to time. Does it make them mad? Does it make them run around? No, I don't think it does. I think any animal that is scared will either attempt to move away or if it's right overhead, will attempt to find some form of cover. So they'll get under a bush or under a tree, uh, a bit like uh, my dad's old dog, Trubshaw, used to do. He used to put his nose in the corner and sit there whenever there was any thunder. And I think while um, these lions are certainly braver and more courageous than Trubshaw, uh, I think they also would get nervous in a huge lightning and thunderstorm. The eye is just shining in the darkness. Ah, MKL, you want to know those other lights, the other safari trucks? No, they're not. They are the lights of a place called the Mara Sun, and I don't know what the other one is. So there are two places where you can stay as a tourist on the hill. So they're way away on the Olololo escarpment. In fact, they've just gone out. <laughs> There's obviously been a power cut. Alice, have you still got power? There's a power cut at camp as well. Luckily, we have an uninterrupted power supply system that works some of the time. Uh, it seems to be working now, which is excellent. It's interesting. Bad luck. Those staying at the Mara Sun. <laughs> okay, now we've got some calling coming in. Let's just go across the others because he will probably not move if the others go up hunting. He will probably just lurk. There's yeah, some more lightning in the background. The generators have kicked in at the <laughs> places I was talking about. Okay, we're going to have to move now. Just need to get around the top there. To move with us because of the rock field. Oh, they've stopped there. They seem to have stopped. Yeah, they've gone to sleep. We won't need to move just yet. He's giving a little bit of phlegm and grimacing. Now, this will tell us quite quickly if he is related to these lionesses. I think on reflection that he probably is. But that phlegm and grimacing indicates that he's attempting or certainly testing whether or not these lionesses are ready to mate. 
And if the male tolerates that, I'll be amazed. The big male, I mean. That is obviously a male. He's playing her very, very close attention in the same way that a male follows an estrus female. And now marking his territory quite close to her. For him to be roaring at this age is, is unusual. He's in nowhere, he's nowhere close to being a territorial male lion yet. He's not nearly big enough, but he may have tacked himself onto this other big male. Let's go just to the right there, Craig, and see if we can't spot some of the others. Can you see the others there, Craig? Oh, we've got one there looking there, okay. All righty, we're not going to move from here. We're going to wait and see what these lions do. In the meantime, we're going to go back across to Byron, who is wafting his spotlight around like Sholto. Uh, there's a Quran in front of us. I don't want to shine the light on it. I'm actually just going to turn the lights off. Sorry, Seb. I just, um, these, uh, uh, you've got the infrared, but that is the Quran. I can hear another one calling in the distance. <laughs> it looks like <laughs> the way it's walking, it looks like it's a little, a little tipsy perhaps <laughs> from left to right. Hang on, is that no? Um, Seb, let's just see. I just want to get a glimpse of this little Quran again, if we can. Yeah, yeah it's just. It's just there. No, I just, uh, just wanted to double check, so it's fine, Seb. Um, Heather, you say it looks like a mini ostrich. <laughs> I suppose it does a little bit. Nice to see a Quran, red crested Quran. We've seen a few of them actually. We haven't seen the black bellied bustard yet for our list. There's one that we're trying to get. I am really so excited about the bird that we did get this afternoon, the um, black cuckoo shrike, the female black cuckoo shrike, beautiful bird. And that was a surprise, I didn't think we'd get one of those. I've only seen one before. I mean they are in the area, you just, I suppose you don't see them that often. So that was a really nice surprise. We're on 91 species of birds that we've managed to get on camera. Nine more until we reach that 100 mark. And we've still got a few more days to get there, so I'm hoping so. All right, we're going to continue using our illumination device to find animals. Let's go across to Scott, who also has his spotlight out.
how nice was that battered fox that Scott got to see? That's a nice surprise. Beautiful battered fox. Um, unfortunately, apologies, he lost uh, sound there for a second. Um, hopefully it'll be up again soon. But uh, no, Scott's managed to spot a lot of these little creatures, the servals, battered fox, wonderful creatures that we don't really see down here. We don't see battered foxes here. I've seen um, the battered foxes up in the Kalahari. We see plenty over there, but not this area. Oh, hang on, what is that? In the grass over there? Is it, it, it looks like a jackal, perhaps? No, I lie, it's a daker. <laughs> oh dear, I apologize everyone, I was just joking, I was just joking. I was, I was actually jealous that Scott got to see all these other little creatures, I was hoping that I found one too, but no, it's a daker. So I don't want to shine the spotlight on the little daker. It just looks strange, the big eyes that were shining back at us. So it looked almost like it was something else in the grass. <laughs> that is terrible. Oh uh, well. Sometimes we get it wrong, but at least we corrected it. Sue Haybu asked if cats or owls have better night vision. I would guess owls, to be honest, um, but I don't know. I, I have no idea. My guess would be owls, uh, because, you know, they... Oh, now this is interesting. Now I'm trying to think. I'm doubting myself a little bit here. Um, the owls... Now let me think on this for a second before I answer. Because, if you think about it, I suppose, let's think of a cat like um, the African wild cat or the serval. They, they've got incredible eyesight, but they also rely on their, on their hearing. And they'll listen out for movement in the grass, and then they'll pounce and try and catch or a rodent or anything that might be moving through the, through the grass. The owls will sit and will perch on trees, and they look around and I think they pick up on the movement with their eyesight first. So maybe the hearing of the cats is better, but the eyesight of the owls might be better. That would be my guess. Not sure. Maybe we can ask James or Scott if we head back to them. And let's ask James what he thinks. Um, let's go to him now. He's got that lioness that he's been sitting with for a while. I'm not sure who's got better night vision. I would say possibly an owl. An owl, of course, has got binocular vision. I think a lion probably does as well, but an owl has to pick up on something much more accurately. So something, well, it depends on the owl, I suppose, but something that is catching rats and mongoose and that sort of thing in the night time has got to be very, very accurate about where it lands and places its talons, whereas a lion like that who's hunting a wildebeest or a zebra, well, she's just got to kind of run at the thing and then jump on it, and it's a much bigger target. So I'm going to say that owls, this is entirely a guess, based on what they have to catch, have probably got slightly better eyes than lions do. That is my take on the matter. It's completely silent now, just the odd cricket game. And every so often these lions turn their heads to listen, and that's normally because there's another lion calling miles and miles away. I'd be interested to know if Scots lions are calling at all. Just trying to listen over to where he is. But I can't see any there. Because they're two young ones, and I don't think they would be calling. But anything goes during migration season. And a lot of the theories we've had about how animals should and shouldn't behave have gone clean out of the window as we've watched this migration season unfold. Heather, you're wondering if lions have a mating season. Heather, they don't have a mating season. They have, uh, they are comp will mate any time and 
What's interesting is that it pretty much goes in cycles of about two and a half to three years. So a lioness will give birth to cubs, they, and then she will breed again in two and a half to three years. Uh, she'll come into estrus. But of course, she'll come into estrus much more quickly than that if she loses those cubs. So if those cubs die, um, probably any time up to their, till they're about two to two and a half years, she will almost immediately come into estrus again. So in fact, it's probably two to three years that the cycle exists. What's interesting that she will not give birth again. So most uh, animals, of course, are capable of giving birth uh, once, or many animals are capable of giving birth once a year. But the strain of raising and feeding a group of youngsters uh, is enormous on lions. So unlike something like a wildebeest, for example, which weans at around about uh, three month, three or four months or so, um, and then starts eating grass almost immediately. Obviously, lions and lion cubs have to be fed until they're about 18 months to two years old because they're pretty useless on the hunt before then. And so in order for her to look after them effectively, she can't have new cubs, even though physiologically there would be no problem with her having cubs. I think we're going to have some greeting. This doesn't look like a, an attempt to go off on the hunt just yet. She's just moving towards the males, is she, Craig? Like I say, I can't see. I'm just watching the screen, same as you. And there are the, there are the males. Greet, greet. Often a precursor to movement, often a precursor to a hunt, as I've said. But I don't know. This lot would confounded me last night with their sleeping not more than 50 meters or so from a large herd of sleeping wildebeest. And down to sleep. A young male is moving out of the way. Now, I'm very glad that Scott seems to have not only found a bat-eared fox, but he's found his gravelly voice. <laughs> Thanks, James. Um, yes, it was a great little sighting of that bat eared fox, and I'm glad that my voice is working again. I'm a little bit out of focus because Manu has got a bazooka on the pedestal and therefore cannot focus on me. But I just thought I would say goodbye from a blurry-faced me, and thanks for joining in on the safari. We are not closing up shop just yet. We will still be out all night, essentially, one of us. Taylor's going to be doing the late night shift. Manu and uh, I, as well as James and Craig, are going to be standing by with the lions until she comes out a little bit later on. So there's some good potential action lined up for later on. For now, though, for the regular PM safari, it's been great. I'm going to say goodbye to you and over to Byron, who is still wandering around the Sabi Sands. I actually don't have a clue what he's doing, but I'm sure he's going to show you a good time. Well, thank you very much, Scott and James, up in the Mara this afternoon. A wonderful afternoon with them, with all the lions. And uh, that bat fox, of course. That uh, that Scott had, I'm I'm very happy about that. That's wonderful. Something different. Now uh, we had a great afternoon too. That big elephant bull in the beginning, and then of course Tingana. It was great to follow him again. That beautiful big male leopard and an owl, a pearl spotted owlet. So it was a su successful afternoon for us. No honey badgers though. We tried, but unfortunately no luck with honey badgers. Maybe before I leave we get a view of one. That would be great. And of course that black cuckoo shrike. So added... and had um, a, uh, a really nice sighting of that cuckoo shrike. So that added to our list, 91 species, 
<laughs> now, apparently, I've had a request from Rebecca in final control in the Mara. She wants to see a bush baby. Rebecca, I'll try my best, but if I can't find you one in the next 60 seconds, go and watch last night's show. <laughs> we, um, we found, we had a great view of one last night. Anyway, thank you again to the team in the Mara. Uh, always nice having them join us. And thank you, Sebastian, the French connection himself on camera with me. <laughs> it, was, it was a nice afternoon. Thank you, Megs in Final Control. And thank you, everybody. Um, thank you for all your questions and comments. It's always nice to hear from you. We'll see you tomorrow morning on our sunrise safari. Have a wonderful evening or rest of your day. Goodbye, everyone.